Hey, hey, it is seed starting day for us here in zone 9B, 10A. It is about the middle of January and we are going to start um, tomatoes and cucumbers and eggplant um, and a lot of herbs and flowers today. So I just thought I would share with you our process. This is kind of to go along with a blog post, Seed Starting 101. Um, so I might not explain every little detail because a lot of it will be written, um, but I wanted to make this video to go along with it as a visual. So coming in here, we already sanitized all of our little seedling cups last week. Um, so they've been in here drying, so I'll probably get them shifted around a little bit before we start actually working with um, our seeds. But we have a variety of trays here you can see in containers. So these are little four inch cups. We usually start stuff like tomatoes, uh, sometimes the peppers in here, something that is probably gonna live in here for at least a month or two, maybe even more before we plant it out. So we're giving it a little bit more space in its cup with its root space. Um, from the get-go. And then um, we're gonna use six packs, little tiny ones and some bigger ones. Um, we'll probably do a lot of the flowers and herbs in something like this. And then maybe more like collard greens and possibly some peppers or something in here too. Um, so it just varies depending on what we're starting on what kind of size we want to use. Um, the littler stuff are again, smaller plants and things that we get planted out quicker that they're not gonna stay inside this um, small container and become root bound um, for too long. And then some other materials that we have are these um, plastic humidity domes or clear lids that go on top of the trays. So these are used during um, the germination process to keep the soil and the seedlings nice and damp and warm. Um, a note about, yes, we're doing this in a greenhouse and it's outside and it's January. No, this isn't a heated greenhouse, um, but it doesn't really freeze here. It doesn't get cold. So if you live in a cold climate, you probably can't do this in a greenhouse in January. Um, but for us, because it doesn't freeze in here at night and we're going to actually put seedling heat mats in here too, it'll help keep everything nice and warm, at least the soil warm, even if the plants themselves get a little bit cool in the evening. Um, and then these are our trays. So we have these really heavy duty, the 1020 trays. Um, really heavy duty, uh, durable plastic. They never crack. We love these guys. Um, you can pick them up totally full of water and seedlings and they don't bend and, you know, give you issues like some of the other, um, less expensive ones do. And they're not expensive, but they're just, um, they are a little bit higher price point just because they're more durable, but you're reducing waste by not needing to buy them, you know, replacements as frequently. Like we still have a few of the cheaper ones and see they start to break and crack and things. So anyways, those are some of the supplies. And then I'm going to get this kind of organized and situated so that we can grab our seeds and our seedling mix and get all that mixed up and I'll let you know what we're doing there in a moment. Okay, so I got some things organized in here. Just put the containers um, into their trays so we can kind of see what we were working with. And then when I fill them with soil that way, um, I like to just grab a couple trays or two at a time and fill them and then, you know, move them on. So I like to have them already all set up for easy moving. And then while I was doing that, Aaron was mixing up some of our soil mix. So seedlings, you really want to grow in a um, seedling starting mix, one that is made for starting seedlings. You can see how light and fluffy this is. There's a lot of, um, you know, perlite and things in there to help with aeration so it doesn't get too compact. Seedlings do not like or want anything with too much food, so they don't need fertilizer at first. They also... Um, don't want any kind of something that's too dense and won't allow good drainage. And then you don't also don't want to use um, soil from your yard because it could have diseases or fungus or pests or things like that in it. So start with a fresh seedling mix. We usually do about 70% seedling mix, about 20% potting soil just for a little, um, you know, oomph to it because they're going to live in our containers for a few months. Um, so we don't want to do something that's too, too light and, you know, not any kind of food or anything in there at all. And then um, we do do about 10% compost in there as well. So 70% seedling mix, 20-ish of the potting mix, and about 10% of compost and or worm castings in our mix. And then I also got together all of our um, little labels the night before. So it's kind of a pain in the butt if you're in here and you're trying to plant everything and then write labels at once and you can see how many labels we have um, stacked up there, but I tried to keep them kind of separated. So we have like our peppers, more peppers, um, flowers. These are the tomatoes, some favas, the greens, the eggplant and the cucumber. So that way as I'm planting, and then these are all the, the seedlings or the seeds that we're gonna plant um, today, have these all separate out from our entire collection that's in the rest of the 
the house, you know. Um, so that way that as I'm going, Aaron can just hand me a seed packet, I can plant and put the seeds in, and then he'll give me the appropriate um, label, and then we can just keep labeling as we go and not have to stop and write anything. Um, and so I like to get these filled up all at once before I even start adding seeds because then it's just kind of one process before we move on to the next process. So I think I'm going to get started on that and obviously we're going to go through more of this. He has another tote out there as well um, and we'll just kind of refill as we go. I left this, that's a good point, I left this partially not completely full because I need to be able to mix this because this isn't moist yet. So we want to pre-moisten the soil. It's still pretty dry. So we're going to slowly add a little bit of water at a time, get this mixed ni nice and moist before we actually put it in our containers. Um, that helps prevent too much compaction later on um, and helps the soil more evenly absorb and take up water later if it's damp first. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get that nice and damp, mix it all up, and then we'll come back once we are filling up some pots. Okay, so we pre-moistened it, and you're aiming for the consistency of a wrung out sponge. So damp, but not sopping and soggy. So this is a perfect consistency. And um, another note about why you want to use this kind of soil, a seedling start mix over a regular soil is also just not only the density, but you know, you can see there's not a ton of huge woody chips or anything like that in here. And seedlings have really, really tender, fine roots. And so you want to enable them to grow. And so if it's really chunky soil, Oil, then you're going to have an issue with them, you know, their, their roots not being able to penetrate. And if the roots aren't growing well, then the plant's not growing well. So let's fill up some containers. Okay, so the reason that we like to put all of our um, seedling mix in a container like this is A, so we can mix up those few different types of soil and compost that we use. B, it makes it really easy to mix in the water and get it to the consistency that we want, but then it also makes it really easy for filling the containers. So I have the empties over here, and then I can just continue to fill one at a time and stick them into the finish tray over here when they're ready to be planted. But what you want to do here is put some in, kind of tap it, shake it, but you don't want to like push and compact it. So avoiding compacting the soil is important and you can just do that over and over until you end up with a full tray. Okay, so for the little six pack type containers, same thing, just set them in there, throw some soil in, kind of try to level it out a little bit. And then with these guys especially, I like to take them over onto the surface and give them a little bit of a tap just to see if there are any big voids in there. This one didn't sink too much, but I'll put a little bit more in. But sometimes you'll give them a tap and all of a sudden it'll shrink down a ton because there was a big void or empty space in there. So by doing that, it'll help. Um, you know, help, help you catch that and fill it before putting your seed in and then watering and then having the whole thing kind of sink on you. All right, so we have quite a few containers full. Um, like I said, I usually would fill them all at once, but just because we're kind of working against the light, we got started today a little late. Um, I wanted to show you a few things and mention a few more things before it starts to get dark. Um, so first of all, I don't want anyone to feel like just because they don't have a greenhouse, they can't do this just because that's the way we're doing this. Absolutely not. Um, most people start seeds indoors um, on a shelf or whatever inside with a grow light. We are going to add um, grow lights. We usually keep all all of our seedlings on this side and we're going to add some grow lights here too um, because it's winter this area we're on the side yard the side of our house you can kind of see the the shadow of the house there this isn't a super super sunny spot it was just the only place we really had to put a greenhouse in so in the winter we do do some supplemental lighting in here too um, and again with the heat mats and so it's virtually just an extension of indoors for us um, but before we used to do all of this kind of potting up and planting of seeds on like the kitchen counter or kitchen table table or on the back patio table if it was a nice enough day to be out there. Um, so don't feel intimidated just because this is our setup and it might not be the same for you. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is what we're sowing today. So um, I explain more in the blog post and if you guys have seen like my garden planting um, calendars and things like that, but we are planting things that like to be started early um, like tomatoes and peppers, um, but we are waiting on things that like to be direct sowed like beans or carrots or radishes. So there's some things that you're not gonna wanna start in pots inside um, before they go outside. 
And then the other thing is too, is that squash can be started early, but not this early. Again, it's still January and we're not going to plant out till probably late March, maybe early April. And squash can take off and get really big, really quick. And they also don't like to get root bound and stay constricted inside um, small containers. And so um, we will wait probably about another month till maybe like late February, closer to a month before they go out to start the squash. Um, so those are just a couple things I wanted to note. Um, and then in terms of when to start your seedlings, it depends on your zone. So that's also where those planting calendars were co will come in. But it's generally um, about a month or so before your last frost date, and then you plant them out just after your last frost date. And that's just kind of a general rule of thumb. Some things take longer to get going, and others go a little bit quicker. And Okay, so let's imagine that all of our containers are full, and I want to go ahead and start planting seeds in these. And so what you're going to do is you're going to get the seeds that you want to plant, and I'll usually do like one whole variety at once. So if I'm working on peppers, we'll do all peppers first and then move on to all tomatoes and so on. So we'll go through our box, grab it all of our peppers. But what I wanted to point out is your seed packet has instructions for how deep you want to sow your seeds. So if you look at this guy, this one says surface sow or barely cover the seeds. If you can see that under planting, planting instructions there. Um, surface sowing is a little bit tricky, so I like to go with the barely cover option um, just because if they dry out when um, by being just set right on top of the soil, it's going to be that much harder to germinate. Um, so I will have Aaron film in a second and I'll go ahead and do some sowing so you can tell. Um, if it's not a surface sown, so maybe something like this, sunflower. So the sunflower you can tell right here it says to sow, it's right near the top there, a half inch deep. Um, so what I'll generally do for something like that, if we're going to be starting them in these kind of containers, is I'll just come through in advance and kind of like poke little holes everywhere where I want to plant them. And then that way I can just come in and pop the seeds in all at once rather than going like one at a time. Um, so I'll continue. These are all gonna be flowers. I think I'll probably do all sunflowers right here. And they all need to be about half an inch deep. So I'm just kind of approximating sunflowers are pretty hardy. So then I can open up my seed pack of sunflowers, pop, a, pop one in the hole, and then bury it as I go. Pop one in the hole, bury it as I go. Pop one in the hole, bury it as I go. And I kind of like doing this just because this is a visual signal to me that these three already have seeds in them if I'm covering them up as I go, and then I can just go down the line. But sometimes if you, say, didn't make all these little holes at first, so say these were still all flat like this, if I poke a hole, put one in, cover it, and then I walk away and do something. Oh wait, did I already do that one? Or what about these guys? So that's just kind of my um, visual way that I do a lot of the seeds um, is to kind of like poke little holes or at least sh small indentations because if they want to be you know only a quarter inch deep, it would just be a little bit. But again, that just helps me keep track because we sow so many seeds obviously that it's really easy to lose track and all of a sudden be like, oh crap, did I plant something in that cell or not yet? So these ones are telling me I still need seeds in here and then these ones theoretically would have been done even though I obviously didn't do that. Okay, one of the things that makes it really nice and convenient about getting all of the labels ahead of time is it kind of helps us guide in our planting. Um, so you can do this however you want to. It's totally up to you and find your own groove, but this is something that we've just found is really helpful um, for us. So basically we can grab all of our seedling tags that we already wrote the night before of the ones that we know we want to plant immediately, put them in their container, um, grab all of those packets out of our box, and then one by one, go ahead and plant those, and then we can take the seed pack that we already planted, we know we're done with it, and put it into a separate pile. So it just kind of guides us along our way of what we, how many we need to do. So here you'll see we have about two varieties of each type of pepper. So here's two gachugarus. Um, we like shishitos, so we're doing three of those. Um, but it's always good to do at least a couple, um, two to three of anything that you want to plant, because you never know if a seedling is going to crap out on you for no reason. It's just kind of an extra little bit of insurance. So even if you don't have room to plant out all all of these at the end. Um, you can give them to a friend or coworker or whatever you want to do with them. Um, but we like to start a minimum of two of something we really, really want to grow. And then more than that, if we know we want a few of those plants minimum to succeed. Okay, so we're going to start with our banana peppers. And again, this one says um, just 
barely surface sown or barely covered. And so we've been planting these for a few years. Um, and by the way, old seeds you can plant. Um, I'll talk about more about that in a moment, but that's all we have left of our bananas, um, which is actually the perfect amount because I would recommend, especially for seeds that are a little bit older, um, like these say sell by 1217. Um, that just means their germination rate is going to go down if they're older, but that doesn't mean you can't use them. And so um, these are still fine, but because that we only have these eight left, I'm just going to plant four and four. Um, so that was kind of a nice example, but I would do that anyways because they're a little bit older. If they were a newer, younger seed, maybe only two or three would be fine. Depends on the germination rate. Um, if the germination rate says that um, they're like only 80%, then definitely do three. But if it's like a 95% germination rate, which means it has a 95% um, chance of success in sprouting, then you can do a couple less. But basically for these guys, I'm just going to sprinkle them in there and surface sowing, they dry out really fast in my experience. So I'm just going to barely put a little bit of soil and that'll help keep them in place to, um, from like moving around and stuff, um, you know, from wind or whatnot. And so put those little guys in there, barely, barely cover them. Super light. Okay. And that's that for the bananas. And again, now we would usually stick this in our already planted pile, but now we can just recycle this container because we're out. And let's do maybe some gachugaru next. So these are some seeds that we saved from plants last year. And that's a whole nother topic, but I'm going to get in here, and I'm not sure what the germination rate will be on this one, so I might sow it a little bit thicker than we would with ones that come from a seed company. Maybe not all of those. I just grabbed a pinch. Um, but that way, you know, because we seed save these ourselves, I'm not 100% sure how they're going to do. So let's maybe do a little sprinkle. That's about five right there. Oh, they're stuck together. So that should definitely give us a plant um, that's worthy. And obviously we have tons of seeds too. So I'm not needing to be stingy and barely cover them up. All right, and that's that. So I'm just going to continue and repeat that process. Um, a note about things like squash, though. There's Zoe. Hi, Zoe. Oh, hi, Zoe. The chicken run is right at the end of the greenhouse if you wanted to see that. Where's the birdies? Hi, Zoe bird. Hi, honey birdie. Anyways, um, now that I'm distracted, what I was just going to mention is that um, if we were doing squash, say, and they're like really big seeds and say they had a really high um, successful germination rate, then I would maybe only do like two. And then for brassicas, like kale with a billion tiny little seeds, and I just grab a whole pinch and throw them in their hole and cover them up. And I don't worry about counting too perfectly. So it kind of depends on how many you have to work with too. If it's a rare variety and you only have a few, then, you know, maybe so on the slightly more conservative side. And we'll be back in a moment um, to show you what we would do after all of these are planted out. All right, so we got three trays sowed so far. We're going to continue to sow into the evening, um, but I just wanted to show you a few things about what the next steps would be now that these are all planted. So as you can see, if you kind of peek between these containers here, we have them on this four foot long heat mat. Um, and I just note, I don't encourage funky outdoor electrical situations. So um, if you need to consult with an electrician or whatever you need to do, um, we have a heavy duty outdoor um, extension cord plugged into a GFI protected outdoor plug. Um, so I feel pretty safe about using this out here, but again, do what's responsible and, and, you know, good for yourself in your own situation. I don't want to endorse any unsafe behavior here, but we do um, also hook up lights, which we will hook up later tomorrow. And I will come back and show you all of that later. Um, but so we've got these on their heat um, because seeds like an optimal temperature. I think it even says it on here is like 75 ish is usually what we kind of set ours on. So 70 to 85 is the ideal um, germination temperature. Um, seeds will and can sprout in colder temperatures, like in the 60s, but it will take them a lot longer and a lot, um, you know, with less success. And so that's why even if you do this inside your home, unless your home is really warm, you might want to consider putting a heat mat underneath your seedlings with the light on top too, um, especially in the winter months. And then the other little nifty thing about the heat mat that we have is we get one that comes with a thermostat dial and it will automatically um, adjust itself so that we can set it. So I set it, if you look at it, at 78 
and then this little probe goes into the soil. So I usually do it down inside one way in the middle of the whole container and then I'll kind of run this line around. Um, and so that's down near the bottom of the mat, down into the soil, kind of packed in there. And then that will trigger this guy to kick on or off at different times. And so in the daytime, when it's nice and warm in the greenhouse, this will turn off and we will be wasting energy and it won't be overheating the seeds. Um, you never want to heat them over 95 because that can actually sterilize and kill the seeds. Um, but with this, we can set it that way. It'll kick on in the evening when they need the heat and then kick off during the day when they don't need it. It's kind of a set it and forget it. Obviously, we're out here checking on everything, um, but we don't have to manipulate it. And then um, in the weeks to come, which is a whole other kind of topic we'll talk more about later, um, but in the weeks to come after they germinate, we can slowly start dialing it back and we have a lot of control um, beyond the ones that you just plug in without any kind of thermostat. Those will just generally raise it like, I don't know, an average of 10 degrees warmer than the room, but you don't really know what it's at. Okay, so we've got the heat taken care of. Now, our soil's already moist, so we don't want to overwet it, but we use, you can either use like a, you know, a, a trigger sprayer where you actually have to pump over and over. I like using this guy because it's a lot easier than spraying over and over and over. Um, but we just want to lightly mist the top of all of our soil again because it probably dried out a little bit while we were working on it. So we're not aiming for a heavy, heavy watering, um, but we just want to mist everything to keep it nice and damp and kind of get the whole little tray a little bit wet because um, that's going to help hold in moisture and humidity when we cover it with our domes in a second here. So we're moistening everything, again, because a lot of these were surface sown too, meaning, you know, they were right near that um, top of the soil level. If it dries out and the seed dries out, it's not going to germinate well for you. Um, so during germination, you want to keep the top of the soil pretty moist. So we'll come back and we'll moisten them maybe every, every other day. It kind of depends. You just have to look and see if they're nice and wet don't need to add more water. If they're looking fairly dry, you might want to give them a little bit of a spray. Um, so I think those are all looking pretty good. I'll check on them later and see if I need to add any more. But just for the sake of the video, we'll say that those are moist and ready. And so we'll set that aside and then we'll grab one of our clear domes. So we want to get this covered and we'll do that to each of them. So again, these hold in moisture and warmth. And so we'll get them all covered up. And the idea is, is that you want to keep them covered until they sprout. Um, and moisture will build in here and that's totally fine. If you run out and you don't have any of these clear containers, um, we actually in the past have grabbed an extra black one if we had more of these than we had clear. And you can just place that on top of one. The only thing is, as soon as they sprout, they need light. They don't need light at this stage. Baby seeds, they don't care. They don't need light to actually sprout. Once they pop up into seedlings, into sprouts, they need light right away. So if you do this kind of situation with a non-transparent cover, come back and check frequently, like every day, because as soon as they pop up, you're gonna want to um, remove the cover because otherwise they'll get really leggy and stretch, which we'll talk about more when we talk about lights tomorrow. So I'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, just a note about this, if they germinate, um, in unevenly like so if you have some in this tray that have per, I call it popped but if some have popped here but they haven't popped here and kind of a mix and you can always mix them around so that you can keep the ones covered that still need to be covered while allowing the ones that are already up to start to breathing and getting happy and um, we will talk more about water I think tomorrow as well so I will come back and I will talk about water and light tomorrow after I um, finish potting up the rest of this stuff because again it's getting a little bit late and I want to get done. Okay my friends it is the next day we've got everything all sewed out so all of our seeds are nice and happy in here. As you can tell the humidity domes are doing what they're supposed to and keeping in moisture and warmth like we want and the heat mats are doing their thing as well so if we go check on our temperature gauge over here you can see that it's at 78 which is perfect you can also see that this little heating indicator light is not on meaning even though the power is on for the thermostat just to monitor the temp the actual heat mat is already off for the day and it's only about 9 30 in the morning so it shows that it'll keep it warm overnight and then kind of kick it off so we're going to talk about a couple of things here now um, first is you can see we have our lights up um, so when seedlings first emerge, um, we're going to keep all of these covered until they actually emerge. And then once they do, um, we want to keep the lights 
and these are just fluorescent lights um, within a couple inches of the sprouts. Um, different lights vary, so read your instructions on your lights. If you get those colorful LED lights, we had those in the past. They gave me a headache. I don't really like how the plants were either that year, um, so we went back to just some T5 fluorescents here. Um, and we have two of them, as you can see. Um, so read your instructions on your lights because some LEDs can be a little bit more like risk of burning or frying the plants if they're too low. Some are made to be held higher. Um, but for most lights that I've seen, and especially fluorescents, you want to keep them pretty close to the seedlings. Um, if they're too high, the seedlings are going to stretch tall in search of the light. Um, and as I mentioned the other day when we were doing um, the other part of the video, even though we're in a greenhouse and we have natural light, it's winter and we also have a bit of shade in this greenhouse. So we're providing these for supplemental light. Um, tall, leggy seedlings that are in search of light are not good. The tall a seedling is um, before its true leaves start to appear kind of the weaker it is that's called getting leggy and it's not a good thing so you want to keep the light close um, if they are getting too tall it's because they're in, in search of light and they're not getting enough so to be able to change those you want to be able to hang this so if you were doing this inside um, this could be mounted like on the bottom of say like a, one of those wire rack shelves or something so you could have these right on the bottom of a shelf and then the seedlings on the shelf below um, so how However that works for you, since we have to go quite a distance for ours, we have them on these clips and little ropes here. And then our greenhouse comes um, with these clips we can get, so we can actually just move these clips around so I can raise this light higher or make it lower, or we can physically um, untie our knot and then raise and lower the light as needed. We've also hooked up little like pulley string systems before too. So this is just what we have going on right now. They're obviously not on um, because the seedlings aren't up, they're not germinated, and so they don't need light yet. So we're going to not turn those on until um, we actually have little seedlings up here. The other thing is we've got two, and these are kind of a skinnier model, um, because we do get some, obviously, natural light in here too, so we don't want to completely block it out. Um, and so we chose to use two skinnier models so that we could still get plenty of natural sunlight coming in through here, um, rather than they have more like big boxy styles, um, which are perfect for if you're just growing completely indoors. Um, then that way you're not worried about, you're not trying to get natural light from another you know angle either. So that is what I wanted to mention about lights. So basically keeping them close, preventing seedlings from getting leggy, and then raising them as they get taller. And we might even lower these a little bit. I, we just hung them up the other day. Um, so once these actually pop, we'll kind of reassess, you know, the, the canopy of light that these two lights are giving them, and then um, see if we want to lower or raise. If you only had one down the middle, that can work too. But remember that these seedlings on this side and then the ones in the back might not get as much light because the one light in the middle is going to shine obviously just kind of in the middle. So then you may need to rotate your seedling containers or your trays um, to make sure that everybody kind of gets their chance in the spotlight. And the other thing I wanted to talk about was ongoing watering. So um, we did a little bit of misting, obviously, enough to keep them nice and moist in here. And I'll keep coming back with the spritzer and misting as needed to keep the tops wet. But once these actually emerge into seedlings, we don't like to water from the top with that mister. We actually like to water from below. So watering from below is exactly what it sounds like. We actually put water into these trays. Um, and then all of these little containers are going to evenly absorb moisture up from the bottom until they're saturated and then they'll stop absorbing. So it's a great way to um, ensure a couple things. A, that all of the seedlings are absorbing at uh, basically a consistent an even manner rather than if you pour in a big slug of water with a watering can not only can you accidentally disrupt all of the little you know tender seedlings and and seeds that are in place up there um, but you might accidentally water these ones really heavily and then water these ones really light or something like that and so um, by doing the underwatering and then it just guarantees a even moisture b um, it helps prevent damping off. So if you continue to spray the little seedling once it's up, so say this was a little green plant here, um, by spraying the plant, it can risk getting sunburned or burned from the light, and also it can um, get a condition called damping off, and that's where the seed will get really, really skinny right at the base of the soil line and actually just like crap over and die on you. That's usually from fungus or disease or mold, but also like overly wet conditions. 
Um, keeping the soil evenly moist is good too because it'll encourage the roots to go down below. So we're just going to grab, I like to use this little like skinny container or skinny nozzle here rather than a big old watering can um, because it can just fit in here. And so we just put a small amount. You don't want to do too much at a time because if it doesn't absorb all of it within about an hour or so, then you're going to want to have to get it out of there because you don't want them to sit in super soggy conditions. Um, so I just add, you know, maybe a quarter of an inch to a half an inch, and then I'm going to let it sit for a half hour to an hour, see how much absorbs. And if it all absorbs, great. If they still look dry, then maybe you need to add a little bit more. If they are still um, too much water in here, then you're going to have to suck it out. And unfortunately, I don't think I have it in here with me right now. But we have this syringe thing that we can suck, suck out the extra moisture. It's kind of like... Um, kind of like a turkey baster or something you could use too. Um, again, because if they don't suck everything up within um, like an hour or two, then you want to remove that extra moisture so they don't get too too soggy. And obviously your trays need to be sitting pretty level. Um, so I'll need to come back and make sure that our trays haven't shifted with time um, because we don't want the water oops, pooling in the backside and then not getting to the front side. So your trays need to be pretty level. And that's how we like to water our seedlings on an ongoing basis, just using a can and then pouring into the bottom rather than doing the misting from above. The misting from above is just before germination, and then we take to watering from below after germination for the different benefits that I already explained. Okay, so just another thing I thought of to mention about watering before we move on from that topic is just that um, the goal with obviously for germination before they're sprouted is to keep everything pretty evenly moist on the top. Zoe's starting to talk to us over there again. And then um, once they've sprouted, then we want to keep the soil moist, but you can allow it to dry out just a tiny bit before water or between watering then. Um, so it's just going to depend on your house and your humidity and your conditions and whatever it is, um, you know, that might impact your amount of water that you need, the size of your containers, you know, larger containers hold more moisture so they don't dry out as quickly. Um, so you're just going to have to assess, you know, kind of gently feel around in the soil and see if it's still wet or not. Um, don't let your seedlings or your soil completely dry out in between watering, but you also don't want them like sitting in water all the time. Um, they need to kind of have some chance to breathe. They breathe through their roots, so if they're drowning, they're not going to be able to breathe very well. So you want to try to strike a nice balance there, and you'll get that with time. And then there's all kinds of information that I could talk to you about about ongoing seedling care. Again, this is supposed to be more just kind of a quick visual to go with um, the post about Seed Starting 101 that I have on the blog. Um, if I post this on YouTube, I'll put a link back to that. Um, but as far as ongoing care, I'll probably add to this video or do a separate video later. Um, but, you know, some of the things you'll have to keep in mind is thinning. So once a few of these pop um, and they have their first set of true leaves, we usually use a small little set of, of scissors. I don't have them in here, but little trimming shears um, to actually trim down to just one strong seedling per container. If you don't thin, um, it'll cause the sprouts to compete with each other for water and air and um, nutrients and soil space and things. So thinning is really important. Um, if they start to become large in these containers, you may need to pot them up. So I have a few different sizes over here that we kind of go through as we're potting up things. So, you know, these are the ones we started in and then we might pot up some peppers, say into these six inches. These were the four inch, the little ones. And our tomatoes, we end up potting up into these eight inch containers eventually before they go outside. Cause Again, they're in here for months, um, you know, maybe not months on end, but at least probably a couple months until they get planted out here. We usually do late March um, to early April. And so as they grow, they need more space for room, for roots to continue to grow. If you keep them all in tiny containers, especially like our little six packs that we've got down in here, you know, these are going to get root bound more quickly um, and need to be either transplanted outside or potted up. Um, because otherwise if they get root bound, it can constrict their growth and actually permanently stunt them. So you don't want them to get root bound. And, um, the last other thing was just about before you ever go from transplanting these guys from the greenhouse into the great outdoors, um, you want to harden them off. And so that's the process of gradually introducing them to a better condition outside. So we would usually take our seedlings, um, out here into the front yard somewhere and we would keep them like, this is a nice shady side of the yard. So we would put our seedlings out here, um, get them acclimated to the condition 
conditions instead of just putting them straight into our garden beds over there. And you do that slowly over the period of a week, gradually increasing their time and their um, exposure to the amount of sun over the process of a week before you can transplant them out into your garden beds. I think we got something fun going on over here. So we'll say hi to the Romanesco and then that'll be that. So I hope you found this helpful and ho hopefully you can check out the blog that, um, the post that goes along with this because then it's all written. You don't have to just listen to me ramble for 20 minutes, but again, hope that was helpful for you guys.